So with that, I'm going to go ahead and dive in. Um, I, this first talk is an intro for people who are developers and are coming to ClickHouse for another database. I think a lot of you aren't in that um, in that position, but I still hope you'll find some things that are interesting about it. And we'll also use this as a recording because we just want to make it easier for devs to, to get in and, and be able to use uh, ClickHouse um, uh, uh, efficiently. Uh, by the way, we had a question that popped up from Andre. Will the session be available offline after? Absolutely. So it's streaming to YouTube right now. So that recording will be available. I'm also recording it through Zoom and we'll post that afterwards. We'll probably break the talks up into pieces and we'll also post the slides as we generally do when we're, when we're not lazy. So, okay, I'm going to get diving into the talk. So um, your first ClickHouse data warehouse. And let's make it go forward. Um, on, Alexi, can you just confirm that you can see my screen okay? Uh, yes. Okay, great, thank you. All right, uh, this is just a little bit of uh, bio and a brief bit of marketing about uh, Altenity. I'll promise it'll be short. So I've been working on databases since 1983. It's the main thing I've been doing in my career. I've been actually programming since I was a kid, which is now over 48 years uh, uh, since I started. Uh, so as I say, mostly on databases, I've worked with about 20 different um, uh, 20 different databases of which ClickHouse is the latest and currently my favorite. Um, I've done a couple of uh, detours into things like virtualization and security. We had a company that we sold to VMware in 2014. So I spent four years uh, working for them on, on those topics. And then I do a lot of work with Kubernetes. Uh, we we're as a company and um, also our users are pretty big on running data warehouse and Kubernetes. So that's a topic we come to pretty often. Uh, as far as Altenity, we're uh, the enterprise provider for ClickHouse. So if you're a big enterprise and you know, you're building or a little enterprise for that matter and you're building analytic apps, we help you do it successfully. So we do services, um, we have a cloud platform. Um, we'll uh, touch on that in this talk uh, and most importantly for the community, we, we sponsor community events like this. Uh, we really, we all of us have long uh, careers in, in open source databases. Uh, most of us worked at some point on MySQL or around MySQL. And uh, as a company, we're big committers to uh, ClickHouse as well as the ecosystem project. So we're uh, after Yandex, the number two uh, committers. So that's us and that explains why we're doing this uh, doing this talk and why we love, you know, just telling people about ClickHouse. So let me introduce ClickHouse. It, I don't know if there's anybody on the talk who hasn't heard about ClickHouse, but if you have, if, if, if this is your first time, this part of the talk is for you. So ClickHouse is an open source data warehouse and data warehouses are designed to answer open-ended questions about business data. And by open-ended, I mean that you will answer, you know, ask a question, uh, for example, like how many sales do I have uh, by region, by product? That's a pretty standard one, but basically any combination of, uh, you know, sort of properties that you might have about sales, you can combine them in a query and then ask to see aggregates, for example, you know, like numbers of sales, amounts of sale, average sale, uh, the, the place where you had the least sales, the products that had the most sales, things like that. And these often involve data sets that are extremely large. They have a lot of properties. Uh, so in other words, a, a wide number of columns um, or wide, wide range of columns and the data, data sets can be very, very long. So when we're dealing with machine generated data, as for example, web logs from click streams, the, uh, the number of records that you have to deal easily runs into trillions, even for trivial applications. So that's what data, that's the kind of problem that data warehouses are designed to solve. And ClickHouse is really the first data warehouse that's a, you know, uses SQL and really can compete with proprietary products like Snowflake, uh, like Redshift uh, and like others. Um, you can think of it in some ways as kind of like the MySQL of data warehouses. And so like MySQL, it has a lot of similarities with MySQL. So for example, it has a single binary. Um, it understands SQL. It's pretty portable. Excuse me, it runs on everything from bare metal to clouds, anywhere that Linux does basically. <clears throat> 
Where it does departs from MySQL, and we'll talk a little bit about this uh, later in the talk, is that it stores data in columns instead of rows. We'll talk about that and what that means. But basically, the effect is you can think of every column being it being stored as an array. And whenever you're um, reading data or writing data, you're basically just doing sequential, always doing sequential IO. Um, it is also very good at parallelizing query. And this happens at a couple levels. So within a single host, which is what we'll be talking about today in this talk, uh, ClickHouse is very good at breaking up the, these, these columns into pieces and farming them out to all your available CPUs and, or cores as the case may be. Um, and we also use SIMD instructions whenever we can. So a, a single instruction, uh, multiple data. The idea is that these are um, vector instructions that allow you to do operations on multiple pieces of data simultaneously. And this is only possible when you're dealing with arrays. ClickHouse also parallelizes very well. Um, so in the sense that we can spread data across many nodes, there are people that run clusters with hundreds of nodes, and you can actually have queries that span dozens or, or even a hundred nodes. Um, and ClickHouse will happily go out, uh, you know, sort of query each of the nodes and then federate the results back and, and hand you an answer. Uh, scales, obviously, if you're talking about that kind of parallelization to uh, petabyte data sets are very common and it's open source Apache 2.0. The big thing that people really notice about it is that it's super fast. I have a demo, which I'm not gonna to do today, but it's a video on our site where I run a query that is, I first used uh, generated in, in memory numbers, and then I go read, uh, read from storage. And the thing I always say is, well, what do you think is faster? It turns out that ClickHouse can actually read faster off storage than, um, than uh, data generated in memory, at least if you choose the query properly. So it's really quick. So, so that's ClickHouse. It's, um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to talk, let's imagine that you're coming to ClickHouse and you've never seen it before. The first question is how to install it. And this is pretty easy. And I think most people on this call are, are tech folks. So you're not going to, um, this is not going to be a big deal. Um, your first choice is you can just use standard uh, Linux uh, installation mechanisms. Personally, for me, when I'm developing on ClickHouse, I prefer to run it on a VM. Uh, so I'll just spin one up in Amazon or uh, on one of my local machines in my closet. And then depending on what I'm running, uh, I'm typically an Ubuntu kind of guy. So I will uh, install it from Debian packages. And that's the commands we're showing here. But we all there are also uh, community builds for RPMs and tarballs. And uh, so if you run the commands that are shown here, you're basically just going to get the latest so-called stable build, which means a, it's kind of a bleeding edge dev build. It's past the basic test, but it's probably not something you want to, to run in production, but it's stable enough that you can start development. And you can do the same thing with RPMs or tawballs. So that's that's a simple way to get started is just spin up a VM or, or you're maybe running Linux on your laptop, just install it. It doesn't take a lot of resources to run. Another way that's really popular though to, to run ClickHouse, and this is particularly in build pipelines or for people who are running like on a Mac where there isn't a really, a, there, there are builds for Mac, but they're not super stable. Um, <clears throat> you can run it in Docker. And so this shows the, the Docker command to, uh, to set it up. Uh, we're using a, a minus, if you're familiar with Docker, we're using a minus minus volume. Uh, setting here, and that's so that our data will persist. Uh, you know how Docker images are, they have a habit of disappearing. This will ensure that if we blow the container away, we don't lose our data, which is a good thing for Docker. It also allows us to upgrade it. So, and we do, um, we just go ahead and reroute the ports, which are 8123 for H, uh, HTTP traffic and 9000 for what's called TCP protocol traffic, and you're up and running. And if you have a good network connection, both this and the previous one, you can you can basically have ClickHouse up and running in about 60 seconds. So the third way that you can get hold of ClickHouse, and this is a, a recent thing that's really um, just happened this year, is there's actually now cloud emerging cloud platforms for ClickHouse. The first one to get out of the gate was from Yandex. They run it in Yandex.cloud. So if in you if you're in Europe, um, you know, and and are happy be you know, content with running in Yandex data centers, you can check out the Yandex managed service for ClickHouse. We have a, uh, at Altenity run, uh, what we call Altenity.cloud and that runs in Amazon. It'll eventually run in other places, but for now that's um, uh, 
uh, runs there. So that's a final option that if you want to spin up um, ClickHouse and really try it out, this is um, uh, this is another thing to do. It this is more inter particularly interesting if you are want to try out the capabilities of the data warehouse and kind of understand, you know, like different configurations of storage, amounts of storage, numbers of nodes, replication, um, all these sort of fancy things that are, you know, sharding things that are, are used to build large systems. They're actually cloud systems are very nice because they allow you to try that stuff out really quickly. So that's three ways to get hold of ClickHouse that are pretty good. And and people use all of them. The final question for getting started is, where's the docs? And it turns out that ClickHouse has a really great, for an open source project, has a really good set of docs. Um, a lot of work on this done primarily by the by the Yandex team. Uh, go out to clickhouse.tech, and there's a really nice website out there. Um, Ivan Blinkoff, uh, who's one of the main main community people, um, it put a lot of effort into putting this together, it looks great. And so there's documentation, um, you know, sort of get started type documentation. There's also uh, reference uh, documentation for ClickHouse features. And any of us that use ClickHouse, we spend a lot of time out there. I, I basically have about, usually have about four or five tabs of this open at any given time. So that's the first part of, you know, when you're first encountering ClickHouse, this will get you started. Um, so the next thing is how do you get started on application development? So you've got ClickHouse up, it's running. Um, and so the first thing you wanna do, or what we recommend is go check, if you've never seen ClickHouse before and you don't have a system that you can just start working with, go run the ClickHouse tutorial. So this is on the website. The URL is shown here. And what that's going to do is show you how to get hold of a pet data set. Um, I think it's the airline uh, data set. I don't, I didn't scroll down far enough. I, I load it from a different location. Uh, but basically it will walk you through how to load a, an interesting data set. And for ClickHouse, interesting means, you know, like 150, 200 million rows of data. Um, and it will show you different, um, the, you know, like how queries are structured, how tables are structured, uh, introduce you some basic features of, of ClickHouse. If you go through that tutorial, you have a pretty good sense of what ClickHouse can do. So that's a really great way to just get started. And what's cool about ClickHouse is that this is something that you can do even if you really don't have much database experience. The, the tutorial walks you through. So if it's your first time using, for example, a data warehouse, you can, um, you know, you can, you can be productive fairly quickly um, and, and, and get started. So the next thing you do after you've done that is go load your own data. So the, the, real, the really interesting thing is to see queries running on your own data sets. And so, oh, sorry about that. Um, must be another customer calling. Um, so let me just go through um, some hints for how to get started. So the first thing is just to start out by designing a table. And one of the things about ClickHouse that's, you know, if you're just beginning, is ClickHouse is super fast uh, for reasons that we'll dig into um, uh, shortly. So what you can do when you're setting up a table is, what I recommend is don't stress about the table very much. So, you know, don't stress about getting uh, the, the data types right. Don't stress about, you know, making sure that you have the right primary keys and things like that. Uh, a lot of the stuff that you have to deal with um, you know, for example, in MySQL or Postgres, we really have to think about third normal form. Uh, don't worry about that. Just stick all your data into a big fat table, get the data types roughly right. We actually know people who just start out by putting everything in as strings. And then over time, they just evolve them into the right data type. So here's a simple table. The things you do want to do are um, you want to use what's called a merge tree table. That's the kind of the workhorse table. I'll show you how it works in a second. The second thing is you'll want to partition your data. So partition, partitioning breaks the data up into pieces. And this is really important for making data warehouses run quickly. It breaks the table up into pieces which can be uh, processed in parallel. And generally speaking, if you're dealing with any large data set, there tends to be some time component in it. So a pretty standard way to partition is to partition by month or day, just pick one. Um, it, you're you're aiming for something that gets you maybe a few hundred partitions. Um, so, you know, if you have a year's worth of data, doing it by day is great. If you have 10 years worth of data, doing it by month 
works pretty well. That would give you, um, you know, in both cases about 360 or so uh, uh, partitions. Uh, you want to, you have to provide an ordering and I'll show you how this works in a second. You just pick something reasonable. In this case, it's, um, it's a table of sensors. And so I'm just ordering them by the sensor ID and time. And then finally, um, compression is really important in data warehouses, but you don't need to worry about it when you're starting out. We'll talk about how to uh, optimize that shortly. All right. Um, Oh, have a question about this partitioning. Yeah, so uh, let's see, it's Svetoslav. Let me find you and you can. Hi. Hey, Hi. yeah, go ahead. I'm gonna flip to the next table because it'll probably illustrate what you're gonna ask about. Okay, uh, in the query, in the create table query you were showing, it was uh, partitioned by year and month. So, yes. For example, my project has uh, a lot of data which is statistical data for clicks. And uh, it's uh, usually a group by day, month, or year. And we plan to introduce uh, an hourly breakup, a grouping. So what what would be the best uh, partitioning by? Uh, year plus month would be enough? Or we have to um, actually, I, depending, unless your data set is huge, I would just start by partitioning by month. So what'll happen is the fact that you're grouping at the hour level, that's no problem. That's taken care of in the queries. Um, and, and, and we'll see some examples of how that's, how that's dealt with shortly. So yeah, just go for, just go for month. Yeah, it's an affiliate network actually. So the data would get really, really large, I assume, because yep. uh, it also includes uh, revenue share offers where the same yep. thing can buy multiple times. So yep. okay. no problem. Year and month, that would be enough, I guess. Yeah, that that's fine. That that's that's a good start. What is actually more important is, and so here's what the table looks like underneath. And I'm, I need to make sure that I don't go too long on this talk, so I don't okay, sure. freeze Alexia out. But um, underneath the parts are organized, and if you go in and look at the files, you're going to see two general types of things. You're going to see what's called an index, a primary.idx, which is a sparse index. And by default, whatever you order by is going to be used to construct this index. And so um, in the previous example, I was no, using... It's more, about the, it's more about the grouping. It's more about the grouping by. Yes. Yeah. So what this is doing is if there's a natural... Well, well actually, what's interesting about this... Or, this ordering is one of the most interesting things. Um, so the one of the things that's really important is to get good compression on the columns, mm -hmm. you want to organize your ordering in such a way that the columns don't vary as much from value to value. So for example, if you have a, just imagine that you have sessions on a website yeah. uh, with users. So the properties of any click in that session tend to be roughly the same across that session. So it's kind of nice to have an ordering that includes session because what that will do is it will mean that there will be long, potentially long stretches in your columns where the ordered values um, as the columns are sorted by that order by very, very little. And so your compression is going to be fantastic. Okay. So our, our problem actually is that we have a click ID where each yep. value in the table will be totally unique. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, well, what, yeah, what you want to look at, it, this is something where I actually think it's important, again, you know, as you're starting out, don't stress about it, because okay. it's really easy to figure out whether it's working or not. And then what you want to do, what you will want to do is allow for the fact that you'll, you may need to reload your data a couple times as you're, you know, in development, as you discover different ways to order it. And, um, uh, you know, so that it, so that it gets the best performance. Yeah. Okay, so we'll uh, add it on yeah. the development server and test uh, the best performance. Okay, thank you very much. You got it. Okay. So Merch Tree then, just, it has the index. You have this sparse index, like when you use the index, that, that order by, um, it can be used to as a pri essentially as a primary key. It will find rows. But the important, the other important thing is that what it'll be looking for is it'll go out and it'll just use this sparse index to find the blocks containing data. But these blocks are pretty big. So they will by default hold about 8,000 rows, uh, the values for 8,000 rows in, in each block. And what that means is that, um, you know, like if you do a read and you look for a single row, you'll effectively over the columns that are in your select, you'll be reading 8,000 rows. So it's a kind of interesting property of ClickHouse. And we'll look at that a little bit in a second. 
So next thing you want to do once you got a table is, is load your data. So two popular formats for loading that we use a lot are CSV um, and ClickHouse. These are called um, uh, uh, input formats in ClickHouse, and ClickHouse supports a bunch of them. Um, but two real popular ones are CSV, either with or without the names at the top of the columns, and what's called JSON each row, where each line contains like a little JSON blob, um, as you see in this example. And you can load these pretty easily. If you have small data sets, the simplest way to do it is just to pipe them through ClickHouse Client, which is your standard client for talking to ClickHouse. Super useful tool. So this is um, this is how you connect to ClickHouse. And what I'm doing is, for example, just catting the uh, readings.csv. That CSV values in the query that I'm going to run is insert into meetup.readings. And then I tell the format that the pipe stuff is coming in, and that's it. We use this for loading, in some cases, hundreds of millions of rows um, or billions of rows even. Same with JSON. So this is a quick way to, and pretty easy to do from the command line. There's another interesting way that you can read uh, data, and that's through what are called table functions. So a table function, and this is an example of what's called a file table function. It basically reads your data, it, it, it looks, Inside the uh, ClickHouse, it looks like a table, but it's really reading from a file. So in this particular case, it's reading from a file called readings.json. There's the format as JSON each row. You have to tell, you have to give it a clue what, what your data types actually are. Um, so you'll need to, um, this is an example of how you do it. Uh, this particular one, table function requires the, the files to be in a known location where ClickHouse can find them. And it's by default in this place called varlib ClickHouse user files. So those commands up above are just, you know, kind of getting the data out there where it can be read. And that's a little cumbersome. So actually, if you're really reading a lot of data, one of the best ways now is to get it out of S3. And this is pretty new in sort of ClickHouse 20.8 and beyond. Uh, ClickHouse 20.8 is a sort of a mid-year um, mid version of ClickHouse that's now stable um, or fully stable for enterprise use. So you can read from S3 in uh, using a command like the following. The cool thing about S3 as well as the files is they will take wildcards. And uh, what that means is like if you had like say a hundred of these uh, these files, you could actually read them and, and there's a, a setting that allows you to parallelize them. Uh, but but this is a really good way of, of loading a lot of data fast. So if you're coming off Snowflake, what you could do is dump it to S3, um, you know, in whatever format Snowflake dumps it in and then uh, read it back out like this. So the final thing is, you know, like sort of as you're, you know, planning your attack on uh, or your siege on ClickHouse is now you've got your data loaded uh, or some fraction of it, just go crazy with your own queries. And what I recommend doing at this point is just go read the, the start with the docs for select. Select is the most well-developed part of the ClickHouse uh, SQL vocabulary, and it is incredibly powerful. It, um, it doesn't have window functions. That's one difference if you've used other data warehouses, but it is incredibly, um, uh, it has an inc it's incredibly feature rich. It has these things. So, for example, it does group buys really efficiently and easily. Um, it it uh, has basic support for common table expressions. It has arrays, which I, I just wrote a bunch of articles, blog articles about it. So, incredibly powerful feature. Um, so, uh, these are all these are all things uh, um, uh, that, that that you can do. Oh, by the way, there's a question from. Uh, uh, from Barry does uh, about that S3, does it support local S3 deployments like Minio? The answer is yes. And in fact, it supports it better than S3 because when we initially started, we were using Minio, uh, Minio the, the free version in the build pipeline. So yes, it supports that quite well. Uh, so you should be, able to, should be able to use that. All right, so back to select. So that's, you know, at this point you're on your own, you're Sort of, you know, you're you're now surfing your data. You're up on the board. Uh, you're, uh, you know, riding the waves and just try stuff out. And uh, so, 
uh, one question you'll have is, of course, if you're developing apps, what about client libraries? Well, there's a bunch of them available. So I've got five of the most popular ones. Um, interestingly enough, um, and and there's there's more of them listed on ClickHouse.tech. For PHP and JavaScript, there's a bunch of little libraries, but actually what a lot of people did and what we did, for example, we do a lot of PHP. Um, we actually didn't even use a driver. ClickHouse has a uh, an HTTP interface that allows you to submit the queries just using HTTP and then get the um, uh, you know get the results back as a payload in in various formats. Uh, so we just rolled our own. Uh, it took uh, I was talking to Andre a couple of days ago and he said it took him about two hours. So uh, you can write very very simple code and that's particularly important coming from you know like Node Node JS or PHP where they've already got good um, uh, support for REST API calls. Uh, you can you can just do that. So I, for my own part, I normally use Python or ODBC if I'm working with it, but uh, we we do a lot of work with GoLang. That uh, that driver is also very stable. Um, and then of course uh, C++ is super stable. Java is is okay. That that actually um, is probably the least well maintained of all all of the ones that are shown here. So. For the final part, I'd just like to talk about a little self-defense. Um, it's possible that you're coming to this and you've you've worked with other databases, so like MySQL, and um, in which case your brain is probably somewhat polluted, and uh, it's important to have a little bit of a, a notion about what's going on under the covers, and, and particularly to understand the difference between a row store and a column store, which is also um, a data warehouse. So, um, so MySQL is a good example of a, of a row store. And the way that it works is that let's say that we have, this is sort of a, a cartoon of, of a table and you've got columns A, A, I, and K that you wanna select from, but the data in MySQL are all stored in rows. So what that means is that if you do a query where you're just looking for those three columns, <coughs> MySQL is basically without, a lot of uh, extra direction, it's just gonna allocate a single thread and it's going to go and read each of these columns uh, or excuse me, each of these rows one by one, pull out the A, I, and K columns and throw everything else away. What that means is if you have like a hundred gigs of data, which is, a, you know, for analytics, kind of a small table, you're gonna read a hundred gigs just to answer, just because you're doing a table scan. And so as a result, you know, when you're using MySQL, in fact, you always add indexes, you tend to do a bunch of things that reduce the number of rows that you actually have to look at. The problem is that analytical queries often require scans. So this is, this is why databases like MySQL don't do analytic queries very well. They do other kinds of queries and we'll talk about that. What happens with ClickHouse is that you are, because the data are stored in columns, if you refer to three columns, that's all you read. There's there's a couple files uh, for each one um, by default, and ClickHouse will allocate multiple threads to read them, typically based on the number of cores that are available. So it zips right through them. And uh, so we're reading compressed columns, we're reading them in parallel. And so the fact that they're, that the columns, that we're only reading the columns already means that there's essentially no penalty for having very wide tables. So having tables that are highly denormalized and have a bunch of extra data, you just don't pay for them in the query because you don't look at them. So um, this is an example of an airline data set that, that actually is the one that figures in the tutorial. And if I have a query that reads three columns, I'm actually only going to read about 3% of the data. The table has 109 columns. And so I will only read those three columns and leave everything else. So already I've cut out about 97% of the data. What's interesting though, is on top of that, I don't read the uncompressed size of the data, which would be normally the case with MySQL. I'm gonna read the compressed size. So these blue uh, bars here actually show in this particular table, how much data there really is in the columns based on uh, how well they compress. So the um, the ones that don't have a blue bar were data, you know, ones that didn't have any data, so they, there was nothing even to read. So, so that's the second thing is that that you want to understand about ClickHouse is that beyond the fact it's reading by columns, is that it's really important that the compression 
has a magical effect on your performance as you're doing these as you're doing these big queries. And there's three ways that you can get data to compress. First is to choose a, a good data type. So one that's not too big. So, you know, like if you can fit it into two bytes, great, use two bytes. Um, the second thing you can do is put codecs on it. So a codec is a transformation that changes the data. And then the final thing is, is compression. So codecs know about data, compression doesn't. Compression just sees bits. So here's an example. There's a data type called low cardinality and that's a dictionary encoded string. So what that means is instead of storing the string, um, you, you actually store an integer that represents that string and you put the string in a table somewhere. And this is great for, you know, uh, strings where there's maybe 10,000 values. So for example, worldwide airport names is a good example. Um, there's no codec applied to this. And then let's say we do LZ4 compression. That's the default out of the box compression. It's quick. Um, it doesn't require much tuning and it's not very expensive to, to decompress. Um, the, uh, here's another example. We're storing something as an unsigned 32-bit int. We're going to put a double delta codec on it. So instead of storing the ints, we're going to store the slope of the slope of the ints. So imagine temperatures, for example, or or uh, sensor um, IDs, which are are sorted in such a way that they're sequentially increasing. What that means is is we may store a very, very small amount of data, and then we're going to apply ZSDD compression to it. So this is an optimization that when you actually start to you know, get close to deployment, you may want to go and actually go in and uh, change the tables. And ClickHouse gives you a huge amount of control over this. So in this particular example, um, I'm using ZSDD1 compression, there's different levels, and I'm using, um, you know, different codecs. So T64 for decimal, that's, that one is um, reasonable for decimal, double delta, as I just mentioned. I'm also doing another trick where uh, the date can actually be computed from the time. And so I use what's called an alias, which makes it computed. And if I want to save space at the cost of some extra computation, that's that's something else that I can do. Uh, all of these reduce the amount of stuff that I'm going to have to read. So, um, and the, the the effect is phenomenal. So this is a, there's a table called system.columns. As you get, dig into compression, you want to get very familiar with it because it shows you the column values or the columns for all of your tables and tells you how, what the compression levels are. So for example, that sensor ID, when we apply, and time um, columns, when we apply the codex, we get down to basically um, close to a thousand fold reduction in the size of the data. It's really impressive. Um, temperature, which is stored as a decimal that doesn't compress so well. So, hey, nobody's perfect. Uh, but this, this means that this is one of the big reasons why ClickHouse can do these big scans so fast because the amount of data it's actually reading is very, very small. So, so this is, you know, like thinking about compression and getting it to work is something you really want to do. Um, and then there's a final thing that uh, ClickHouse doesn't use indexes in the same way that databases, uh, conventional row databases do. Row databases like MySQL use indexes to find things. And one of the things you get used to in MySQL is the notion of a covering index where, for example, you're looking for the maximum value of something. Um, well, you can actually, if you have an index that has the values, you can just read that out of the index. And um, so you have a lot less um, stuff to scan. And so people will look to try and do this in ClickHouse. Well, ClickHouse doesn't work that way. Um, there are indexes, but they're used to avoid reading things. Instead, we have what are called materialized views. And materialized views are, um, basically a transformation on a table. So you have like a readings table, which I've been using as an example. I build a materialized view that stores the minimum and maximum temperature for each sensor for each day. And it's kind of like an index. It, it vastly reduces the amount of data and it allows me to, to reduce the um, size of the query. And as a result, by constructing this materialized view, I can, um, I, you know, go ahead and, uh, you know, do a query that comes back lightning fast because it doesn't have to scan a lot of data. So this one came back in about um, a hundredth of a second or 11 milliseconds, which actually for this kind of thing is kind of slow uh, because um, uh, 
but but the thing you have to uh, that you have to know about this was this was actually running on an Intel Nuke, which is a very very low power machine, and the data the the, the data set that it was coming from had 500 billion rows on the Nuke, and the materialized view is able to reduce it down to something where I can get the query result this quickly. So this is a very very powerful feature, and when you think about indexing things, one of the things you want to look for, you know think about you know like hey I would have used an index in my SQL or Postgres. Uh, think about a materialized view uh, to, to help make it faster. So in general, uh, performance tuning is, is really different. I think for devs, this is actually advantageous because there's no query optimizer. This means that if you're not a SQL DBA or like an Oracle weenie, um, you're not expecting, you don't have to understand a lot about the database to understand the magic it's doing because it's not doing any. Um, what you end up doing is is tuning your queries. There's a system log, which is really powerful. You have these system tables, which can tell you things like compression. You just learn to use these um, and, and basically make your queries faster. And the performance of, of ClickHouse queries is really simple. It's basically driven by the IO to do the scan and then the amount of CPU you can apply to the stuff that you read. So that, you know, so there's a bunch of, and, and there's, you'll get to learn over time you know, which parts of it can be parallelized, which parts have to be done um, in sequence, but um, this is stuff you can, this is stuff that anybody can learn. Um, I think the number one tip is to use the, the ClickHouse query log. It's basically tells you what ClickHouse thinks it's doing and how much data it's reading. So like if something is going slow, you go look at the query log, you figure out, okay, it looks like it's reading a lot of data and then you try and make it read less data or it doesn't have enough threads, okay, give it more threads so that so that it can get through it faster. So these are just tricks for enabling it. Um, and just generally, the final thing you wanna know is where to use ClickHouse and, and its strengths versus, um, versus a row store. So row stores like MySQL are tuned to do what's called online transaction processing or OLTP which means that you know if you're running a website and you have a lot of small lookups, uh, for example, to build pages or to look at the contents of, sh of, of, of uh, shopping carts or to check whether somebody's logged in, MySQL is really great at that because often the data you have to look at is just one row and it's all in one place. So you can nip in, do that. Similarly, you can update it quickly uh, because you don't use a lot of resources for these queries, you can have a lot of them. And they also have great consistency models. So in, in Postgres, for example, you can create a table, add data to it, create another table, add data to it. You can basically all do that in a single transaction and it either commits and succeeds or it rolls back and wipes everything out. These are all things that, that row data, row stores are really good at. ClickHouse is different. It's designed to answer questions about large data sets. So very long tables. And that's where the scan capability is important. Very wide tables. So the column store, the, the fact that you store things in columns gives you this advantage that you don't have to, you, you, you reduce the amount of data you read. Uh, Open-ended questions, things for which you don't have an index in advance. Um, and then lots of aggregates. I haven't really focused on aggregates too much in this talk, but ClickHouse has a huge library of of aggregates that it can perform. Um, and, and so any kind of computation that where you're sort of grouping things and ordering them, ClickHouse does really efficiently. And the performance in for these types of use cases is sometimes as much as a thousand fold faster than, than MySQL. It's a, and MySQL is, don't get me wrong, MySQL is very quick for the things that it's designed to do, but for these analytical queries, ClickHouse can easily be a thousand times faster. So that's it. Um, I hope I haven't gone too long. Um, be happy to answer a couple of questions while Alexi is getting set up. Uh, these are some more information. Uh, there's just a bunch of stuff now out here. There's a worldwide community generating information. Uh, the clickhouse.tech docs are great. There's a ClickHouse YouTube channel. Alternity has a blog where we you know, sort of do long form uh, articles. We also do a lot of webinars on the stuff. And then finally, the ClickHouse uh, source code, if you can't figure out how something works, one of the best ways is to pull the source code and go look at the test. They have the best examples of, of how to use different SQL features, some of which are kind of obscure. Um, if you see it in a test, you know it works. So, um, and, and you'll get 
get a clue about what it does. So that's it. Um, thank you very much. I hope this talk was helpful. Um, we're, we want to do more stuff to, to make it easy for people to, to learn ClickHouse and, and sort of jump in and, and use the value. So um, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over, stop my share and turn this over to uh, Alexi. But uh, while Alexi is setting up, uh, we can take a couple questions if there are any, or we can proceed to, to Alexi.